This morning we're starting a little short sermon series in the run-up to Advent called Restore Us, O Lord. We're going to be looking at a number of different prophecies from the book of Isaiah. And this morning we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 52. So if you have a Bible, turn with me there or you're welcome to follow along on the screens behind us. We're going to begin at verse 3. For this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately Assyria has oppressed them. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the articles of the Lord's house. But you will not leave in haste or go in flight. For the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the words of our Lord do indeed stand forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your word. And we would ask, even as Isaiah was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, that we too would look for his coming with confidence, understanding, that he calls us to go into this world as we look for him. Lord, we would ask this morning as we open your word, you would open eyes and ears and hearts and minds that we would understand what you have for us and what it is you desire from us. And we praise you and thank you in Christ. Amen. I think most of us are in fairly... uh, Fairly good agreement that we don't particularly like being called by telemarketers, right? Those folks that call us and interrupt our dinner, interrupt our evening, trying to sell us something. Now, the way our phone systems are set up, most of us don't answer the phone anymore of numbers that we don't recognize. But every one of us have gotten called in a call with someone trying to sell us something, right, on the phone. And what is it we usually do if we get called? We try very hard to get through with the call as quickly as we can. Now, some of us who are a little more mischievous than others, this is what a mom said, if a telemarketer calls, give the phone to your three-year-old and tell him it's Santa. I did this job once. I was a telemarketer once. And I can tell you these folks, they're just like you and me, trying to earn a living. But I can also tell you something else about telemarketers. It takes a great deal of confidence to pick up that telephone and call a stranger. Knowing, one, they probably won't answer. And two, if they do, you're going to probably be rejected. I can speak from experience that confidence and calling are both absolutely necessary for a successful telemarketer. But even more than that, I can speak from experience that confidence and calling are absolutely essential for a walk of faith. Now, I don't think we understand the connection of those things very well in the church. Now, I do think we get confidence. We understand confidence, this idea of assurance and hope. That if Christ has got hold of our hearts and we've confessed him as Lord and Savior and and received him by faith, then our salvation is secure and we can have confidence in that. I think we get that. But where we disconnect 
is forgetting that Christ has secured our salvation for a reason. So that we might be a people of praise and be a part of his redemptive work in his world. That's our calling. Now, confidence without calling is false assurance. Calling without confidence is self-assurance. One without the other is not genuine faith. But together, they make a powerful life of faith. And that's what Isaiah wanted the people of God then to know and the people of God now to know. You see, because God is beautifully faithful in Christ, we have confidence and calling. And I want to unpack that statement for just a little bit this morning as we prepare our hearts and our minds to come to the table. And the first thing I want us to think about is confidence, this idea of assurance and hope. And confidence is absolute certainty in God's unchanging character and faithfulness. And it's a very positive thing. God wants his people to have confidence. It's an essential part of faith. But confidence doesn't start as a positive thing. It starts as a negative thing. You see, when Isaiah wrote, Jerusalem had been conquered and destroyed by the Babylonians. God's people had been deported. They were living in slavery under a brutal and ruthless king where worship of anyone or anything other than the king was punishable by death. They were living in a place where they were mocked all the time because of what they believed, where God's name was being blasphemed all around them every day. And this wasn't anything new for the Jews. You see, Babylon was just the next in a line of countries that had oppressed and persecuted and enslaved Israel, beginning with Egypt and then Assyria. Now, God had warned his people through Moses that this is exactly what would happen to them unless they followed his laws and his commands, but they didn't do it. And so Israel was reaping exactly what she had sown, and she had only herself to blame. So once again, God's people find themselves in slavery. Now, they had to have felt absolutely worthless, especially with Isaiah's words, you were sold for nothing. My people have been taken away for nothing. Now, what was God doing? You see, what God wanted was his people to feel the weight of their failure with him. He wanted them to feel the weight of their hopelessness apart from his grace so that they would repent. And they would turn to him and they would cry out in faith again. Now you may think that's really cruel of God to do that. But honestly, it's the most loving thing God can do to a human being. Is to humble us and cause us to see how far short we fall so that we would turn to him from that state and we would cry out. You see, God has to break us down before he can build us back up. And give us confidence. Now there's a rumor going around the church that I'm a bit of a gearhead. It's true. And one of the things I like is race cars. I really do. I like NASCAR racing in particular. Good southern boys all do. One guy I like a lot is a guy named Carl Edwards. Nice guy. Good race car driver. He did a commercial with a group of kids recently that I thought was so good and it really illustrates this point I'm trying to make about God breaking us down before he builds us back up. He's talking to a bunch of kids in a schoolhouse about drag on a race car. So take a look at this. take you out for ice cream. You had me down and you brought me right back up to the bus. I'm driving. We're getting some ice cream. NASCAR. <laughs> That's how God works. He has to break us down before he can build us back up and give us confidence. Israel's captivity, we need to see at the hands of the Babylonians is a picture of how sin operates. It is a brutal and and, and, and ruthless taskmaster, it conquers, it enslaves us. But worse, worse, 
it separates us from God, and only God can do something about that. And he wants to do something about that, but he will not fix our problem with him until he has humbled us. Now, the Jews had to learn this. No question their suffering was acute. I mean, their beloved homeland, their temple was, was destroyed. Their way of life as God's people gone. They were in a very, very dark place. But dark valleys become valleys of vision when we look up. And so Isaiah reminds his people to look up. Look up and see God. Look up and hear his promises. Look up and remember that he is faithful. Even though their sin had brought about this dreadful state, God is gracious and he is faithful to his promises. And therein lies their confidence and therein lies our confidence. And so Isaiah begins to remind them about the promises of God. Verse 3 says, you were sold for nothing. And look, without money you will be redeemed. That's a promise of God's grace. Verse 6, therefore my people will know my name. That's the promise of intimacy with God. Verse 10, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. That's the promise of his return. Verse 12, for the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. That is the promise of God leading us and carrying us along the way. And of course, Isaiah is looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Verse 8, when the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. That is a promise of personal revelation. You realize verse 8 there is one of 21 messianic prophecies in the book of Isaiah that were fulfilled directly by Christ and that's why Paul could say in Christ all of God's promises are yea and amen now you may say okay pastor Bill I hear what you're saying but that book was written a long long time ago how do I know these things are true how can I have confidence in God's faithfulness two words for you the cross and the tomb that's it That's the evidence we have that God is faithful. He will do what he says he will do. And you may get tired of hearing that from me, but I will not ever stop talking to you about the cross and the tomb. So, dear friend, let me ask you a question. What are you struggling with today? What are you struggling with today? You struggling with feeling unloved? Struggling with shame, guilt, fear, anxiety, uncertainty, illness, grief, death? What are you what are you struggling with today? You need to know That God wants you to have confidence in this. Not confidence in yourself, not confidence in the outcome, but confidence in Him. That He is faithful. He will carry you through these things if you're in Christ. He will. But for that to happen, we have to humble ourselves. We have to look up. We have to see Him. We have to hear Him. We have to believe His promises that find their essence in Christ, we have to take Him at His word and cry out in repentance and faith. Now listen, for some of us here this morning who don't know Jesus Christ, this may be the first time you ever cry out to Him. And that's a good thing. My prayers today would be the day of your salvation if you don't know Him. You may say, but you know what, I... I'm interested. I want to know something about Jesus, but I really don't know how to cry out to him. There's a little card in your pew back. It's called the story. Clear gospel message. Simple, simple to read. It tells you what does it mean to cry out to Jesus. Take that thing home. And even if you know Jesus, take that thing home. Share it with somebody. Talk to a trusted friend. Come and talk to me or Pastor Glenn. There may be others of us today, you you know Christ, but you hadn't cried out to him in a long, long time. And there may be others today that this is the tenth time you've cried out to him this morning. Doesn't matter. He stands ready. 
He stands ready to hear you when you cry out, when you humble yourself, when you call in the name of Jesus because he is gracious and he is faithful to broken and needy folks. And it's in that, you see, that we can have confidence. But the question is, does God just want us to have confidence simply as a get-out-of-hell ticket? No, confidence by itself is not faith. It's self-assurance, as we said. Genuine faith, you see, is when we wed confidence and calling. Now, Isaiah reminded the Jews that even in the midst of this great suffering they were in, they still had every reason to praise God because he is faithful to his promises. So it's with confidence in God's promises ringing in their ears and resonating in their hearts. That's exactly what Isaiah says. Listen, lift up your voices, shout for joy, burst into songs of joy together. Isaiah was reminding them they were called to be a people of praise. But they were also called to be a people of proclamation. How beautiful are those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who proclaim salvation. You see, and that's our calling as well. Just like there, we are called to be a people of praise and proclamation. But what does that look like? Well, the first thing it looks like is we're called to praise God. But why do we do that? Why do we praise God? Well, the answer is pretty simple because the Bible commands us. But even more than that, we praise God because it's built into our DNA. It's what we were designed to do. We were made for Jesus, for his praise, for his glory. But what does it mean to praise God? I think we really misunderstand this. What does it mean to praise God? Do you realize there are three Hebrew words that are all translated into English for praise? The first is the word yada, means to exalt, to give thanks, to confess. The second is this word zamar, it means to sing. And the third is this word halal. We get the word hallelujah from this word. It means to honor and to commend. So to praise God, a biblical definition is to exalt him, thank him, confess to him, sing to him, honor him, and commend him to others. Now, why is it important that we embrace this kind of, this full biblical definition of praise? Because if we don't, what we'll do is we will narrowly define praise as that time we're here together for an hour on Sunday morning in this room when we lift up our hands and we sing. And we'll limit it to that. But here's the thing. Praise isn't just singing and lifting up our hands. Praise isn't an event. It's a way of life. It's a worldview. Now, what should that look like for us? How do we praise? What, what will that look like in very practical terms? Let's think about it. Well, I know that praise has to start with spending time with the Lord. I know that. Giving Him thanks for His goodness and a grace. Just, just adoring Him as our Lord and Savior, our King and friend. Confessing our sins and receiving His forgiveness. Just waiting on Him and meditating on Him and meditating on His Word. Seeking His wisdom and power. Listening, listening. And resting, just resting in who He is. There's really no better means of praise than spending quality time with the one you love. What about in our homes with our families? What about in our workplaces where we go to school? What about among our neighbors and friends? How do we praise Him in those situations? Remember one of those words was to honor God? We praise Him when we honor Him through our integrity, our honesty, our purity, our service, our sacrifice, our obedience. We honor Him when we put others ahead of ourselves. We honor Him when we forgive quickly as we've been forgiven. We honor Him when we go quickly to one we've offended and we ask for forgiveness. And of course we praise Him when we come together as His people in this place and we sing. 
But we also praise Him when we gather together in Christian fellowship in small groups. When we gather for accountability and prayer, we praise Him. All of this is praise. Anything that honors and elevates God in the way we live is praise. And you know what? Circumstances in our lives should not change that. See, just like the Jews, even in the midst of great suffering and great persecution, we can praise God. Why? Because He is faithful. I think very often and too often we only praise God when things are going well for us. We're kind of like fair weather praise friends. But I can tell you from experience, and I know I'll get an amen from somebody in this. The sweetest praise is that praise that you can offer up when things are not good. Thank you. I know I put you on the spot. Put the pressure on you. Are you able to praise him in the storm? Like Job, say the Lord's given, the Lord's taken away. Praise be the name of the Lord. There's another aspect of calling we have to see here, and that's proclamation. You see, Isaiah was proclaiming to God's people who were living in captivity the good news of peace and salvation to come, that God was going to liberate them. And their calling was not just to hear it, Their calling was to share it. You see, Isaiah understood something that we need to get ourselves. There's no greater calling than to proclaim good news to a broken and a hopeless world. That's what beautiful feet look like. Paul picked up on this in Romans. Pastor Glenn preached two sermons on this passage just a few weeks ago. But Paul expanded it to show clearly how it was pointing to Jesus. So you know the question I'm going to ask you now, right? What is it? How beautiful are your feet? Now, I know some of us get pedicures. We get our toenails painted. Make our feet look good, right? I read this week that some foot models make $1,000 an hour because of their beautiful feet. Now, most of us, we don't see our feet as objects of beauty, do we? Come on, we don't. I mean, for the most part, I look at my feet and I think, okay, they help me stand up, they help me walk, and they hold my shoes in place. But beauty, I know, and after it doesn't take very many years either of standing, of walking, of running before our feet get calloused and cracked and crooked and smelly. And it was a whole lot worse than Isaiah's day for feet, I assure you. So, why in the world would God use this analogy of feet? Because you see, It's with our feet that we go and we carry the good news of God's grace and his faithfulness in Christ to those who don't know him. Y'all, the most gifted and eloquent speaker in the world is useless if their feet are idle. The smartest, most biblically, theologically knowledgeable person in the world is of no value if they don't go and take what they know. And share it with other people. Now, so I suspect if we're really honest, our spiritual feet are not always beautiful either, are they? But how do we change that? How do we change that? We change that by understanding the beauty we're talking about is not in the messenger, but in the author and the message, the Lord Jesus Christ who's beautiful in his character. He was beautiful in his sacrificial love. Those nail holes in his feet were beautiful. 
He was beautiful in the truth that he personified in every aspect of his life, in his death, in his resurrection. You know Christ lived and he died and he rose again so that the world could come out of their bondage and into a relationship with a Savior who is beautiful beyond description. You see, the beautiful feet belong to Jesus. And so we as gospel messengers become beautiful, not because we go and proclaim, but because we take on the identity and the beauty of Christ when we go and proclaim. We become like Him. You ever noticed how people who have been married for a while begin to look alike? And it's not just people. I tried to find some cat pictures that looked like people, and honestly, I couldn't. <laughs> What's going on with that? I mean, the truth is, we become more and more like those we most associate ourselves with. So the more we hang out with Christ and involve ourselves in the proclamation of the gospel, this beautiful message of grace and peace and hope and eternal life, the more we become like Jesus. And that's why Paul would say, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image. Most of us look in the mirror and what we see we don't like, as James said, and we turn away and we walk away, right? Right? What if we looked in that mirror and saw Christ? Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? Our Lord truly is beautiful and he wants us to be beautiful. Back in the fall when I was over with Julie Soltis for a few weeks in Austria, one day when the oasis was closed, I went into the city of Vienna and I just walked around this ancient, beautiful, beautiful old city. Had a great time. As I was walking along, I noticed this young man, clipboard in hand, paper, pencil, you know the kind, marketer on the street in the mall? He's walking toward me. Now, what do y'all usually do? Right? Oh, I just remember I had something to do over there, right? He came up to me and he said, excuse me, sir, do you have a few minutes to answer some questions? And I said, Sure, on one condition. He said, what's that? I said that you'll answer a question from me when, when you're finished asking me the questions. He said, okay, that's fair. Great. So he began to ask me questions about my experience in Vienna, how I would, suggestions I might make to improve a visitor's experience there. It was a really nice conversation. I like this young guy. He was a young guy, really nice guy. He said, well, we're done now. When we got through, he said, you had a question for me. And I said, I do. And he said, what is it? I said, do you believe in God? And he looked at me kind of funny face and he said, I don't know if I do or not. And I said, why is that? And he said, I went to church when I was a young boy. I was raised in a Catholic family. But as I got older, all they ever talked about was the things we could do and the things we couldn't do. It was like all we talked about was the rules. And he said, I have a trouble in my heart believing that's what God's about I said I understand I said I really do understand I said but let me ask you another question what if what if there was a way that you could absolutely know God is true and he's real and even more that you could know that he loves you so much he would give up the thing that is most precious to him just for your sake Would you be interested in hearing about that? He said, I think I would. I said, can I tell you about it? He said, yeah. We sat down and I began to share the gospel with him. He listened. He said, I'm going to think about the things that you've said to me. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. I left him my name, my email address. I said, look, you can email me anytime. I haven't ever heard from him again. But here's why I tell you that. I didn't do that in my own strength. In my own nature and strength, you know what I'd have done from that guy? I'd have turned and walked the other way. 
I did it in the confidence of the Lord because that's my calling and that's your calling. You see, because God is beautifully faithful in Christ, we have confidence and we have calling. Now, here's our assignment for the week. Real simple. With biblical confidence... Believe and apply, that means believe and do, your calling to praise and proclaim Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do praise your name. We do thank you that in Christ you give us confidence, not in ourselves not in anything we do, but in what Christ has done and finished on that cross at Calvary so long ago that we celebrate at this table this day. You tell us to approach the throne of grace boldly. We can approach this table boldly in Christ. It's our calling. You tell us to come and fellowship with Christ and with one another at this table, remembering what he did. And it's in that memory we have more and more confidence. But you call us not just to come here and partake of the elements. You call us to come, be fed, nourished, fellowshiped, and then go and proclaim. Strengthen us, nourish us as we come this morning, we pray. We ask it in Christ. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he took the bread And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the remission of sins. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this wine, you proclaim my death until I come again. Beloved, come and approach this table and meet with Jesus here with confidence. He calls you here this morning.